Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Golden State Warriors uh, for hosting this, and of course, uh, the incredible uh, Golden State Warriors Senior Vice President uh, of Communications, Raymond Ritter, for assisting and helping put this together. Uh, I am truly excited and delighted uh, to announce the USA Basketball Men's National Team coaching staff, led by head coach Steve Kerr and Eric Spolstra, Mark Few, uh, and Monty Williams as assistant coaches. Uh, obviously, uh, this is an incredible staff, great experience, uh, very talented. And Coach Kerr uh, is someone who uh, has had remarkable success at all levels uh, throughout his basketball journey, some of which I, I'm going to reference here so I don't get it wrong. But as a player, he won five NBA championships, led the University of Arizona to the NCAA Final Four, was a member of the last U.S. team comprised of collegians to win a FIBA World Cup. And he is considered one of the game's greatest three-point shooters ever. And as a coach, he's renowned for cultivating outstanding chemistry and providing invaluable leadership uh, as he has led Golden State to enviable success, numerous records, and three NBA championships. Uh, in his role most recently as an assistant coach for Coach Popovich and the 2017 through 2021 USA national teams, he gained valuable insight and coaching experience both with the USA national team and in FIBA competitions. And he helped lead the US to a gold medal finish at the Tokyo Olympic Games. In my opinion, basketball people would agree that he is the ideal candidate for the US a national men's basketball team. Coach Kerr's success as an NBA coach and his USA basketball experiences make him the ideal coach to lead us into the future. And so without further ado, I want to announce and give the floor to Steve Kerr, head coach, USA basketball men's national oh. team. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Grant. What, a, what an incredible honor and um, opportunity. It is uh, truly humbling. People say that all the time, but this is truly humbling when I think about how few coaches have ever had this opportunity uh, to be uh, the, uh, the coach of the Olympic team and, the, and of USA basketball, um, and how many amazing candidates there are out there. Um, so I have been very, very blessed, very lucky in my career and this opportunity is the result of um, being in the right place at the right time, working with the right people, um, having a lot of people lift me up along the way, and, um, and then, you know, given the opportunity uh, to be part of USA Basketball over the last few summers. Um, so first I want to thank you, Grant, um, Sean Ford, Jim Tooley, uh, General Martin Dempsey, uh, all the senior members of the uh, USA Basketball Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I also want to thank Jerry Colangelo and Greg Popovich for the opportunity to be part of the staff over the last three summers. No question that the reason I'm sitting here now is because of that opportunity. Uh, so thanks to Pop and, and Jerry. And, and I will say that the experience I've had over the last few summers has been just an incredible uh, basketball and life experience. Um, you know, to coach with Pop, to experience uh, both the World Cup and the Olympics, it's a really unique situation. It's a unique environment. It's basically a six-week uh, sprint uh, where you get the players together and you get the coaching staff together and you got to figure out a way how to win pretty quickly. And I think back... Um, to this past summer in Tokyo, winning the gold medal, doing so with a group of players and coaches, we will share that bond for life. And I think the same thing that attracts players to want to play uh, for the national team is what attracts coaches. So I know for me, um, working with Pop, working with Jay Wright, um, Lloyd Pierce, um, Ime Udoka, Chip England, Will Hardy, uh, Jeff Van Gundy every day in that coach's room 
first in Vegas and then in, in Japan, was just incredible. Um, the, the learning environment, the chemistry, uh, the buzz you feel as you're trying to accomplish something together, and then to meet with the players you know, after your meeting and try to put it all together. It's the ultimate uh, challenge and the ultimate high as a basketball coach to experience this. I could not be any more excited, um, thrilled about the staff um, that we've put together. Um, any one of these guys um, could be the head coach, uh, Eric Spolstra, Imani Williams, Mark Few, all so qualified, uh, all have been involved with USA Basketball, and I can't wait to get to work uh, with those three gentlemen um, and with the, the other staff members that we'll put together over the next couple of years. Um, Finally, I want to thank the Warriors um, because, you know, I, I've had one coaching job in the NBA with the Golden State Warriors, and my life has been enhanced beyond belief by coming uh, to the Bay Area and working in this organization with Joe Lacob and Peter Guber and the rest of the ownership group, um, Bob Myers, um, all the assistant coaches, uh, that that I've enjoyed uh, having by my side over the years, and you know, most importantly, the players, um, Steph, Draymond, Andre, Clay, uh, down the list. Um, those are the guys who are responsible for me sitting here because you don't uh, reach this level unless you have success, and you don't have success unless you have players. Um, so I want to thank thank the Warriors and thank all of our players, and that's a good reminder that you got to get some players for us. Uh, <laughs> In the, in the next couple of years. Thank yes. you. We will get some players indeed. Now, are there any questions? Yeah, I mean, you kind of just referred to it there, but obviously your post-playing career it was, it was TV, it was GM. I think you always have talked about wanting to eventually get to coaching, but uh, you know, now your Team USA coach, you seem very solidified here with the Warriors. It, do you just kind of view this as, as this is just kind of your career moving forward until basically retirement, essentially? Yeah, I mean, I, I just uh, sometimes I think back on my career and I just sort of wonder how it all happened. You know, uh, Grant and I um, first really got connected in Phoenix when uh, I was GM and he was he was a player. And, um, you know, to 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 think back at, at all the opportunities I've been given and and that I've received, it's it's sort of remarkable. It's um, and as I mentioned, it's it really is. Um, a matter of being um, being very fortunate with the people around me. I think back to the coaches who I've played for, uh, Coach Olson at Arizona and also with the USA Basketball in 1986 and um, all of my NBA coaches, you know, Cotton Fitzsimmons and Lenny Wilkins, Craig Popovich, Phil Jackson. I've just sort of continued to find this path where I've had amazing people around me who have guided me and... Um, Somehow the path continues, and uh, I'm not going to stop and think about it too much um, because I'll wonder wonder how it happened. But um, it's happened. I'm here. I love every second of every day preparing to coach basketball. It's a dream job, and um, doesn't get much better than um, being the coach of of the USA basketball team. So I'm I'm thrilled. We have a couple quick ones. First off, you've accomplished so much in your career already. What was it like getting the call that you were the guy for this job? Well, um, it, it was um, it was a surprise, to be honest with you. Even though we spent uh, the whole summer together in Tokyo, and and uh, Grant was with us in Las Vegas, but you know, Sean Ford, um, you know, getting to know Sean over the last few years. Um, it was a, just a wonderful experience to be part of USA Basketball, but you just don't stop and think, oh, maybe I'll be the head coach. It's not something you even dream about. Uh, so you don't, you don't even afford yourself that time and say, I wonder if you just put your head down, you work. So uh, when, when um, this call came, it was, uh, gave me chills. Um, it, it's... Uh, opportunity of a lifetime and um, I can't wait to to work with all these guys
Welcome to The Focus TV, Season 5, Episode 7. Glad to be with y'all this week, as always. Joined by Octavia Wyatt, Raymond Lyons, Cardo Dudley Jr., Wilson Tarpe Jr. And uh, we got a lot to get through, as you guys just took in from the video to start the show. It was Grant Hill introducing newly named USA Men's Basketball Head Coach Steve Kerr and his staff. Um, but Octavia, I know you're going through it, trying to focus on the segment, watch your team in action <laughs> the same moment. Um, I'm going to sit here and just enjoy Watching you kind of squirm uh, during this moment. So go ahead, you know, the floor is yours. Just know I'm stressed, okay? Just know I'm stressed. Um, but I'm going to start with the teams that played already this week, uh, Cowboys versus the Giants. Um, again, we only had two games in NFC East this week because everybody played each other. So Cowboys played the Giants. Uh, you guys know the outcome. If you don't, I don't know what you've been watching all year. Uh, the Cowboys defeated the Giants 21-6. to six. Um, Cowboys... Dak Prescott was 28 of 37, 217 yards and one touchdown. Um, Sonny Pollard, 12 carries, 74 yards and three receptions for 13 yards. Ezekiel Elliott has 16 carries for 52 yards and one rushing touchdown and three receptions for 20 yards. Dalton Schultz, eight receptions, 67 yards and one touchdown. On the other side, you had Mike Glennon, who 13 to 24, three interceptions and one carry for zero yards. Um, Jake Fromm. Six, six for 12, 82 yards. Uh, Devontae Booker had eight carries for 17, 74 yards and two receptions for eight yards. And Saquon Barkley had 15 carries for 50 yards, four receptions for 24 yards. And Kenny, Kenny Galladay had three receptions for 53 yards. Um, it's just, a, I mean, there's not much to say. Just the Giants are terrible. Um, we knew they were terrible. They were still terrible when they beat the Eagles. They just played worse that day, but it's bad. Mike Lennon looks terrible. The three interceptions. I mean, granted, he was running for his life most of this game, like Daniel Jones has done most of this season as well. Um, it's just a bad look all around. Um, as you can tell, he got benched uh, during the game for Jake Fromm, who came um, over <laughs> just recently um because he was possibly had to play due to they had i believe a COVID outbreak recently as well but oh no i'm sorry glennon had a concussion and but he was still able to play um but after this game um i don't think we're going to see glennon anymore they have officially shut down daniel jones for the year due to the neck injury they do not think it's going to be long-term issues with it but as you can tell the season is a loss so, again, I don't know why they won't shut down Saquon as well. Um, he has not been himself ever since he came back from the injury. Um, and obviously you can tell from his numbers, him and Devontae Booker have basically the same amount of carries. Um, but Booker has outrushed him. They have the same amount of touchdowns. Um, so I don't know why they just won't let Booker finish out the year. Saquon needs to get back healthy if they want to do anything next year. Um, on the other side, again, Dallas defense is still carrying them. Granted, you know – I expected more from the offense against the Giants um, just because they're the Giants. Um, but the the Cowboys defense is really still carrying them. They had three turnovers again in this game. Uh, Trayvon Diggs got another one, league-leading interceptions uh, with 10 on the year. Again, we know Michael Parsons has been everywhere. Randy Gregory coming back has been a big boost for them. Uh, Demarcus Lawrence being in the middle also like it's just all around their defense is doing everything they need to do they're putting the offense in great positions to score um but the offense just isn't percolating the way it was um CD Lamb had a lot of drops this game um so it's a little bit shaky you could tell they're rusty you know the talk around the town now is you know is Dak really hurt you know is he going through a slump um but his receivers not catching the ball is not making it easier on him as well um, we know that they've had injuries in the past. We know Zeke has been struggling with his injuries as well. Um, but again, we know they're going to win NFC East, regardless of what happens in the game that is going on now. Um, currently, the Philadelphia Eagles and the Washington football team are playing on a Tuesday night due to a COVID outbreak um, in the Washington football team camp. So the game did get moved to tonight. It is currently going on right now. The score is 10-3. to The Washington football team is currently winning. Um, First quarter has just been just crazy. There's already been two turners by the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. A crazy drop by Dallas Goddard. Um, ball literally went off of his back heel and kicked up in the air, and Logan uh, Thomas was able to intercept it. Um, and then Jalen Hurst got sacked and fumbled the ball. So it's been a great start for the Washington football team's defense, especially with them getting a lot of players back off of COVID. They are still without Taylor Heineke. So um, also Cal Allen is also out due to COVID. So they have uh, 
Gary Gilbert playing, who used to play for the Cowboys. And he was literally on, I think they said the Patriots um, <clears throat> practice squad on Saturday. And so he's been with them all of three to four days. So it's, you would think on paper that the Philadelphia Eagles should win this game just with everything they have going on. Um, and then their injuries that they're still going through as well. But again, it is the NFC East. No, everything goes in the NFC East. You never know what's going to happen. So hopefully, you know, I don't have a terrible night and I, you know, get to smile at the end of this evening. Um, but I, just know I'm stressed. I, I'm always stressed. Like I usually watch these games with the door closed. The, like the TV up real, real loud so nobody can hear me curse, you know, um, and it's it's a struggle. But, you know, God willing, God be with us. Next week we'll have to do this all over again. I'm pretty sure uh, I have to double. I've been so discombobulated. All of these couple, these last couple of weeks is all games against division rivals. Um, I know the Cowboys have one game in there. I think they play against the Cardinals. I just can't think of what it is right now. But it's all division rivals for the rest of the week, for the rest of the year. So. We'll see what happens. I'm glad you're able to get through the segment. Hope you're able to get through the rest of the show without the uh, Eagles driving you crazy. Uh, we're going to pass this along okay. to Keith. <laughs> you said you won't. You already know that. All right. Yeah, <laughs> With Keith's segment, <laughs> college football is over. So no Pac-12 segment this week. Um, he's kind of a draft nut. So we're going to start. Uh, this is his debut draft segment. Take a look, pretty much taking a look at a couple players each week from across the country. So it'll be different players from different conferences, different positions, what have you. Uh, this week, um, you know, I would tell you, but you can watch. So here's Keith with this week, uh, his debut of his draft segment, and that'll be followed by our first break. And then, we, you know, we'll be talking to Raymond about the Wizards and the Go-Go and about games that happened and didn't happen. <laughs> We are now here with the first week of me breaking down different prospects. Today we will be talking about two Pac-12 prospects. <laughs> now, surprisingly, you know, the Pac-12 doesn't always breed first grade talent and all that stuff. But nonetheless, this year I think they have two players who definitely a first round guy. And then another guy who I think, due to his position, won't go first round. But talent-wise, definitely deserves to go first round. First guy we'll, we'll be talking about is... Linebacker Devin Lloyd out of Utah. This guy has been amazing from the beginning of the year. Let's let's start out with some. When I look at prospects, I do a pros and cons list. I look at the different things that they're good at, things they could provide for different teams, and some things that, you know, coaches if they have the wrong coach, it'll show. Things, certain things like that, because there's a lot of talent in the league that you know people see them as older oh, generational guys. Then they go to a team with coaches who don't quite understand how to use them let's use Cordero Patterson as as an example like the guy has been been in the league for at least six seven years and is now researched his career in Atlanta because they're finally understanding how to use him and look at the talent that guy has and I think Devin one of the best things about Devin Lloyd is how versatile he is and a guy that he reminds me of now he isn't this guy and will I will I do I think he's gonna be this guy no but he reminds me of Micah Parsons in how versatile he is. And by saying he's versatile, I mean by how he's able to blitz the quarterback and also drop back in coverage. There aren't a lot of linebackers who can blitz the quarterback as well as those guys can, but also be as solid in coverage as they can. When he <laughs> goes from sideline to sideline, you the guy reminds you of Bobby Wagner, kind of, because he's able to cover so much ground at, in such little time because in the NFL, it's, you don't, it's not a first choice, second choice type of thing. It's a one choice, and it's got to be right. And in college, this guy has made that one choice, and nine, nine times out of ten, it's been right. So I'm going to trust that this guy's instincts and awareness is where it needs to be. And I think he is the best linebacker coming out of this draft. I think he will scream up scouts draft boards come combine time because I think he'll run a great 40. And, you know, every year... The, guy, the, the guys who are at, like, tackle, linebacker, who run amazing 40s, obviously go higher than they probably should have. Um, Jamin Davis ran a 4-3 last year. Everybody had him in the second, third round. After he ran a 4-3, he was then pushed up to the 19th pick to Washington. So you see how the 40 kind of changes the linebacker position and how different how the combine impacts all of these guys. I think he's above average at tackling. When, and what I say that means... 
Every game, this guy had two to three tackles for losses. This guy was wrapping up. like one, If it got past the front four, it wasn't getting past him. He was amazing at covering ground, knowing where he's supposed to be. And the guy's just lengthy. When you watch him play, he doesn't even have to use his body as much as most linebackers have to because of how lengthy he is. With, with being that lengthy, you get to cover so much ground. And on top of being that lengthy, he is quick. He has great awareness. He has great instincts. All of those things together make a very good linebacker. This guy is very talented. I think he can fit a few teams. I think he fits the Giants really well. I think he fits Jacksonville really well. I think, you know, with the loss of Joe Schobert to the Steelers, I think they're lacking. You know, Miles Jack is still an impressive linebacker, but that middle linebacker is something that they've lacked for quite some time. And there are many other teams who are lacking that middle linebacker position. And Devin Lloyd could definitely be that guy to fill that hole. I see him going between, at the highest, I see him going 12 to 25. In between there, I think Devin Lloyd should be drafted. I think his cons is that he's still kind of raw, like, same same as Micah Parsons was. They were both still really raw. And as you see, Micah Parsons was able to get untapped by Dan Quinn. He's got to find a defensive coordinator who can do just the same thing as him. I think he kind of compares to Jamie Davis in a bit because they're both lengthy, fast guys who can cover a lot of ground. But the difference is where they get drafted. I think one of the one of the unspoken things about the draft is where people get drafted and how important that is. Mahomes isn't Mahomes if he doesn't go to the Chiefs. Lamar is not Lamar if he doesn't go to the Ravens. Guys have to, I think guys being a scheme fit isn't talked about enough. Guys have to be a good scheme fit to really grab their full potential. Now, do I think Devin Lloyd's talent will be able to hide some of that? Yes, but some of it is just out of his control, but I still do view him as a first-round linebacker out of Utah. The next guy we'll be talking about is running back out of Arizona State, Rashad White. Now, this guy, because running backs have taken like a step back in the draft because you know guys like McCaffrey, Zeke, Saquon were all drafted top 10. I don't think you'll see a running back drafted top 10 for minimum 10 years. Minimum. Because guys like Zeke, Saquon, CMC are all getting hurt. And when you spend that high of a pick on a running back, which in my opinion is one of the most replaceable positions in the NFL, then you're setting your franchise back a few years because now you could have went a different avenue and you're stuck on a guy who was at the position where guys get injured the most. But I do think Rashad White definitely deserves to go in the first three rounds. Will he? I don't know. But I think he deserves to. This guy has great speed. He's elusive. He makes great decisions in the backfield. He's very patient, and his one cuts are amazing. When you watch this guy play, from the, I've had the privilege to watch this guy play in person. And when you watch plays develop with this guy in the backfield, it'll it'll be situations where the defensive line gets through and he's got to make one decision, either to bounce it out or to just gritty it up in the middle. And a lot of times, he bounces it out. And that is trust on his knees and his ability to make one cuts and go. He has been able to make one cuts and break them for 50-plus yard touchdowns. He's been able to hurdle guys. So this guy has all the physicals. Now, only down part about it is he was a senior. You know, truth be told, I think that that whole thing is a myth. When it comes to the NFL and guys being seniors coming out, them being older as a con. But when I look at this guy, he doesn't have many flaws. Coming out of coming out of a lot of situations, he's able to be patient enough, almost Le'Veon, Le'Veon Bell type of patience, where he understands, okay, if this guy goes here, I'm going to go the other way. And most of the times, that's how it's been for him. That's why he's had multiple three touchdown games, multiple 100 plus yard games. And one of the best parts about him is he's a receiving back. And the NFL is, unless you're a guy like Derrick Henry or Jonathan Taylor, who's just that dominant, or Nick Chubb, who's that dominant at running the ball, you have to have 
a receiving part to your game. Saquon, CMC, all these other, Alvin Kamara, all these guys have a receiving part to their game due to not being as dominant in the run game as the other guys I just listed. He has a receiving game, which brings his game to the next level. He, at many points of this season, was Arizona State's leading receiver. So that says a lot about how much his quarterback and Jaden Daniels trusted him and how much the offensive coordinator was willing to build around his talents at running and receiving the ball. These two guys, I think, will be very talented and will pan out in the NFL. And I see Devin Lloyd as a first-rounder and Rashad White as a first three-rounder. And I think both of these guys' limits to potential is through the roof, and they will both come out and be very talented guys in the NFL. I hope you guys enjoyed the first week of this breaking down different prospects. See you next week. Welcome back to the Focus TV. I want to thank Keith for knocking out that segment this week. Looking forward to looking forward to what happens next week. Um, all right, right? Wizards and go go. Yeah, um, you know we should have been talking about a Wizards game tonight, but you know with the COVID situation in the NBA, uh, that game has been postponed. Um, the Nets have just been going through it with this. Um, you know they got pretty much their whole team and health and safety protocols. So, um, so yeah, the Wizards Nets game for tonight has been postponed. Um, you know, the, the league is, they're having a the time with this COVID thing right now as is much of the world. But, um, yeah, they said about 25% of the players are in uh, health and safety protocols right now. So, you know, hopefully that, um, they get a handle on this, but, uh, you know, the Wizards, um, the last time they did play, they broke out of a four-game slump against uh, Utah. Uh, it, was, it was a much-needed win, man. Um, you know, if you guys have been following us on uh, Wizards Outlook, you know, thing, things have been bleak. But, uh, you know, they, they gave us they gave us a little bit of light. Um, you know, it, it was one of their best games of the season uh, against against the top team in the league. So, again, man, it, it shows the potential that the team has. And we've we've been harping on it since since training camp, really. Um, if they perform on the defensive end and everything else follows, you know, it, it was it was evident again uh, in their game against the Jazz. They were they were solid defensively. The energy was there and it fed their offense. So um, that's that's the formula for them. They've got to reestablish what they, um, you know, what they started to cultivate on that end to start the season when they were um, when they were 10 and three. And, uh, you know, over the last 17, 18 games. When they struggle, it's it's been evident that their defense has been non-existent. Um, whatever trust that was seeming to build was completely gone. Um, you know, they weren't cohesive as a unit, uh, and um, and the effort was bad, uh, plain and simple. And they were um, they were undisciplined. They were fouling a lot. So uh, you know, it, it was good to see them get back on track. So um, yeah, man. Hopefully, uh, won't be any more postponements or anything like that moving forward. But, um, but yeah, man, it's, it's good to see them get back in the win column. And, uh, you know, hopefully they can, uh, they can carry this over. Um, as far as the go-go, uh, they are seven and seven on the season. Uh, they just finished the G League Winter Showcase. They went one and one. Uh, they lost to, um, to Birmingham Squadron and they beat the Iowa Wolves. Uh, you know, for the go-go man, I, I just been really looking at Isaiah Todd. Man, he, he's he's really been coming on. Looks like he's starting to fully adjust to the pro game. Um, you know, he, he's a, he's a talented guy. He's uh he's lengthy. He's kind of like the prototype wing player for the NBA. He can um you know he can shoot it from range. He went seven seven to nine from three in their last game, uh, twenty five points. So he he's just really starting to to come into his own. Basically, he's averaging. 14 points on the season um and he's he's just emerging as as pretty much the go-go's best player at this point um you know and with the with this COVID situation man uh and then uh you know with the Wiz kind of struggling he you know he might be seeing some time up top pretty soon you know because he's he's been he's been consistent um he's on a, he's on a two-way deal so uh so yeah, man, it, it would be, it'll be good to see him, um, you know, on the on the big boy team. Um, 
But yeah, and if, and if he can bring this confidence that he's showing recent in recent games when he does get those opportunities, then uh, then yeah, who knows, man? This guy could be the limit for him. Um, other players are kind of standing out. Uh, Jordan Goodwin, he had a triple double in their last game uh, 10 points, 12 rebounds, 10 assists. It was the second triple double in franchise history, so you know, that was um, a bit of a bit of a milestone occasion for him. Um, overall, man, the go go there, they're just trying to figure it out, you know, which is typical of a young team. Um, at different points in the season, they they were either lights out defensively and their offense struggled. Or, you know, they were lighting it up on offense and the defense kind of faltered. So uh, they're just trying to put it all together right now, <laughs> you know, much much like the Wizards, which is uh, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, for the most part, they're a perimeter-oriented team, but they do have some presence inside with uh, Jaime Ekenike and, um, and Greg Monroe, who they signed uh, prior to the season. Um, you know, he just brings a lot of uh, NBA experience, and he can uh, – you know, he can just kind of guide those those young guys through this experience. But um, but yeah, man, they're 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 pretty solid, all things considered, man. It's again, like I said, um, it's a very, very young team, and pretty much everybody is new to this. So um, so yeah, things are they're they're gonna hit their um, peaks and valleys. So um so yeah, man, it's the one thing you just want to see from them in this position is uh is constant improvement. And uh, you know they're they're showing glimpses here and there. Um, you know, a couple times they have been been able to put a full game together on both ends. Uh, but uh, of course, the goal is just to um, you know to make that routine. So uh, they're they're just still working to maximize their potential, and uh, and, and they're getting there, man. You know, guys are guys are starting to get comfortable. Um, you know, Cassius he's he's pretty much trying to get back after starting the season slow with uh, missing a few games with injury. And um and just trying to find his way, so so yeah, man, the go go um they'll be back in action on the twenty eighth to start the second half of the season, and uh, you know hopefully they can um they can just kind of pick up where they left off. All right, thank you, Ray. Uh, Nine four fifty breakdown this week is a breakdown of a drop jab push out and options off it again. It's a breakdown of a drop jab push out and options off it again. That's what Jamal Hayward has for you this week. Well, we see you guys when we get back from the break. And uh, Cardo's going to talk some college basketball with you all. And uh, you know, I got a little bit to add to that as well. Today we're going to work on a downhill move. Uh, it's named two things. Uh, drop cross, uh, drop push out, or front change. Uh, so we're going to break that move down. And we're also going to show you a hezzy option off of that move that is pretty lethal, whether using it for a floater, a finish at the basket, or even a jump shot, depending on where you're at on the court. So we're going to start here at the top of the key. I'm going to start with my right hand. So if I'm coming downhill, selling the move, I'm going to drop the ball. But I'm not going to drop it slow. Drop quick. As I drop, as I release that ball out of my right hand to the floor, I want to shift my body that way, okay? Shift my body that way. Now, the defender has a couple things to do now when you do both those things at game speed. As a defender, you drop the ball. Some people look at the ball, but your body may go that way also too. Some people watch your body. So you may go with the body, ball's over here. So now, if the defender does that, drop, jack, push, shot, or layup. Same thing with the ball on my left hand. Drop, jack, push, jump shot, or layup. Now, the heavy option is pretty legal. So, drop, jab, push out, pause, exit. Now, with the heavy, once I do this move, I want to bring my right hand to the ball. So once I push out here, bring my right hand to the ball, try to keep the hand from going under the ball. 
right hand to the ball, eyes on the rim. Eyes on the rim like you want to pick it up and shoot, okay? That's going to lift the defender up, lay up, float him. You can push away, jump shot, doesn't matter. Welcome back to the Focus TV. Again, special thanks to Jamal Hayward for knocking out this week's 9450 breakdown. <laughs> now I'm going to pass this on to Cardell for this week's college segment. All right, yeah, man. Uh, another rough one for GW Women's. Um, they failed to Lehigh earlier today, 70 57, dropping to 66 on the season. Um, honestly, it came down to, you know, what basketball really comes down to who makes shots and who don't. And uh, Lee, Lehigh made shots from deep and dominated GW on the boards, and GW couldn't throw it in the ocean. Uh, GW shot 31% from the field. What kept them in the game, well, what made it respectable is they shot 36% from deep, and but they shot 55% from the line. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, we watching a, t a local team on the NBA level. We got struggled at the free throw line all season, and, uh, you know, it's a big reason why they're 500. It's hard to win close games or to stay in the game if you're missing free throws. But Lehigh shot 43% from the field, 41% from deep, and 80% from the um, charity strike. And they out-rebounded GW 46-33. Uh, to put, it, put things in further perspective about today's loss, uh, Lehigh turned the ball over 21 times and won by 13. So imagine if they took care of the ball. Uh, GW, GW senior floor general local product, ER frame, scored a team high 14 points while junior for, for Faith Bleeding. Added 10 points and four rebounds. Lehigh sophomore guard Mackenzie Kramer torched GW with 31 points, three rebounds, and three assists on 10 to 16 shooting from the field and a ridiculous seven to 10 from three point range. Uh, senior guard Megan Walker added 16 points and six rebounds. While 6'3 senior four Emmanuel Brothers posted a double double with 12 points and a game high, 20 rebounds. Uh, GW Women's will next host Westchester next Tuesday at 4 p.m. Uh, on the men's side, they will host University of Maryland Eastern Shore tomorrow at noon. I'll be in the Smith Center to provide coverage, you know, as GW look to make it three wins in a row before beginning the conference play December 30th against, you know, the A-10 favorites, uh, St. Bonaventure, uh, who who are currently eight and three. Uh, the game will be broadcasted on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, as for my weekly standouts for, you know, local products playing on the collegiate level on the men's and women's side, um, on the men's side, I'm going to start with Charlotte Junior Point Guard, Jameer Young. Um, the Matha product uh, scored a team high 27 points, grabbed nine rebounds, and handed out four assists on 12 of 21 shooting, and an 82 79 loss to ACC leading Wake Forest. Yes, uh, Wake Forest is currently in first place in the ACC. Uh, you know, it's just a hell of a performance for Young, who who I think is, but, you know, I guess it's arguable, you know, the, you know obviously. You know, their record aren't, isn't the best at this current time, but for since he pretty much stepped on campus, he's been the man for Charlotte. Uh, he's arguably, you know, the Conference USA's best player. Uh, he's definitely a pro prospect. Uh, he can score from all three levels, uh, run a team, obviously make players better, get them the ball where, you know, they're threats. You know, solid defender, you know, he's 6'1", and, he, and he's more athletic than what people give him um, credit for, man. You know, despite the size, he's not a freak athlete like, I guess you could say like a Nate Robinson or somebody like that to come down the window on your head, but look, he has enough athleticism to get the job done. You know what I mean? And uh, the performance he put up against weight uh, just solidified that he seems to always has his best game for for the high majors. You know, just to send him a message like I'm on par with y'all. You know what I mean? So uh, he he's definitely a special talent, one to keep an eye on. Uh, this pretty much been his career, you know, but he's stepping it up right now as a junior. Uh, he's averaging 20. 0.1 points, 6.2 rebounds, and 4.1 assists on 47% from the field, 35% from deep, and 86% from the line this season. Uh, on the women's side, I'm going to shout out uh, another, you know, obviously uh, Bishop McNamara along, uh, Madison Scott. 
Ole Miss sophomore forward. Uh, she finished with 12 points, five rebounds, three assists, and two steals on 6 8 shooting uh, to lead Ole Miss to a 61 53 win over number 18, South Florida. Uh, Ole Miss is currently 12 1 on the season. Uh, they should be cracking the top 25 soon. You know, Scott is averaging 11.2 points, 5.8 rebounds, and 1.7 steals on 52% shooting from the field so far this season. Uh, right now, her role is kind of be a Swiss Army Knight type wing. Uh, definitely lead with defense, and, and, you know, when she get a chance to score, put the ball in hole in an efficient manner. But right now, she's kind of the, you know, workhorse as far as they put her on the best, uh, best perimeter score, try to slow them down. And uh, grab rebounds, do all the dirty work, and get in when she fit in. Because right now, obviously, Shakira, everything's focused on her or whatnot. But she, she's um, she's thriving in her role, and she's become a key claw for them. And a big reason why, you know, they're probably they're at the top of the SEC, uh, being, you know, being 12 and 1. So, you know, I like what I'm seeing out here. Obviously, I'm going to keep an eye on her. You know, obviously, it's a lot of hype, a lot of buzz with what they can do as the season progresses, especially when tournament time comes. And, uh, you know, for her to be a sophomore already making this type of impact, you know, just just happy to see her grow from where I saw her, you know, as a high school at Bishop McNamara when she was trying to find a way. So, you know, much respect, man. You know, hell of a performance. And, you know, definitely knocking off a ranked team uh, that sends messages across college basketball. All right. A um, little Terps update that I have every week. Uh, the Terps were back in action today, early today. Matinee action against Coppin State in Baltimore. Maryland won 98-52. Five players scored a double figures, led, uh, led by Katie Benson. We had 22 points. Hometown kid Angel Reese, uh, her seventh double-double of the season, with 12 points and 14 rebounds. Uh, one big development for Maryland, a positive development, that is, was Diamond Miller played a season-high 16 minutes. She scored 10 points. But most importantly, it's just great to see her back on the court, especially for uh, that length of time, um, considering how – you know, what she's been going through this season, just trying to find her way back to the court full time. A uh, Coppin State was led by Mossy Staples with 16 points. Coppin State's head coach, Laura Harper, played at Maryland under Brenda Freeze from 2005 to 2008. And Miss Harper was part of that 2006 National Championship squad. It was Final Four Most Outstanding Player. Maryland has a break before returning to the court December 30th uh, for a Big Ten matchup with Illinois. On to the WNBA. This is something we talked about all throughout last season for the Mystics, uh, the type of year they were having. We talked about, you know, Coach G signing the extension, uh, what uh, kind of looking forward to how he's going to tinker with this roster. Uh, you can add another big piece into that. The WNBA draft lottery took place Sunday afternoon, and the results are that the Washington Mystics hold the first pick in this year's WNBA draft. So I want to ask you guys what you think about them getting the first pick. And if you have any thoughts or indications on who they might be taking, uh, as of right now, we can revisit who. You don't have to have that answer. But we'll start with Octavia. Just what do you think about, you know, uh, like I think Kalia Copper texted, like pretty much I done messed up and gave Coach the first overall pick. Um, and, again, Copper knows that firsthand. She was drafted by the man uh, once upon a time before being part of that uh, that trade for Elena Belladon. And we all seen what, uh, you know, Kalia Copper's going to become at this current <laughs> point in time KFC. as she has free agency man uh, they, they fumbled the bag on that sponsorship but not shocked but i tell you what do you think about that i mean basically everything you said like when i saw it and i saw the news i was like oh <laughs> it's about to be a good season because like you said like mike t know what to do and i'm just excited to see what they do with the pick um to see you know what comes of it because you know, it's crazy to think like they're only what three, three or four years like uh, removed from winning the championship. And of course, you know, they had a lot of injuries. COVID happened. A lot of people weren't able to play. So and even with that, they were still able to have decent seasons after they won the title. So I'm just so excited to see them. I won't say reload, but like retool and fine tune everything and to see what they're going to do with this pick. Um, so I'm just really excited for the season to start now. All right, Ray. Yeah, you, you can't get that dude the first pick in the draft and with this type of free agency class that's out there. <laughs> you you just asking for it. But um I mean the, the the since they won the championship, man, it's been they've been having a hell of a time. 
you know, it was the, um, the bubble season, um, you know, when they had a lot of people out. Then uh, the the previous season, uh, the season that just ended, uh, you know, with all the injuries they had to deal with. So, um, so yeah, man, it's <laughs> it, it's it's they they got their reward for for going through going through hell basically. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm excited to see what happens with it. Uh, you know, it's 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 gonna be a lot of talented young ladies that that come out in the draft this year, um, and then of course, you know, to see. What what uh, what Tebow does with it, um, I I think he's he's proven his his point uh, by, by this time. If you know if if you don't believe that this is a very dangerous situation for for the rest of the league for him for him to have this pick, then you just haven't been paying attention. Um, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm I'm excited to see what what comes of it. Uh, you know, the Mystics they're in a bit of a transitional period. Um, their team could look totally different next year. Who knows? But um, but yeah, man, it, it's gonna be interesting to see how it pans out. Cardell. They, they have up. <laughs> they have up. Like, I just I, look. I I didn't expect the message to get it because I just I, I felt like the the league knew better. You know what I'm saying? It's just like we're not gonna help y'all. You got the mad scientists over there, though. You know what I'm saying? He can go so many ways with it. He can draft. Uh, you, you know, he could draft a top prospect. I know a lot of it is, is you know, predicated on what Aaliyah Boston do. You know what I mean? Let's just keep it a buck. You know what I mean? Um, you know what I'm saying? Because if they, if the Mystics have their full team, they're deep as hell. You know what I mean? You know, Leash is coming back. Emma, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming Emma's going to come back. You know what I mean? But the one thing that they didn't quite replace, even though Tina was there, and that that's a big elephant room when she come back, where she resigned. Uh, they never had a, a a reserve center to kind of match what Latoya Sanders brought from that championship team, and now she's coaching. That's why I'm just like I'm focusing more on the bigs. They don't need any help on the perimeter. Delanon will be healthy. You know, Emma will be back. Uh, you know, the only <laughs> the, the person that might hurt the most might be Maisha. You know what I'm saying? It's just you know because it, it just gives them a chance to get deeper, or you could package the first pick. Go get some veterans to come in that to you know boost your roster and make y'all deeper and slide down in the first round or whatever whatever you, you want to do. Like that dude has so many options now, and that's what happens when you have the first pick. So um uh, it's just sick, man. <laughs> like it's just sick. It's like, yo, y'all keep giving this dude chances, man. And he's gonna utilize it. And he, and uh yeah, they better help for you know, injuries because I expect it to be, you know, even worse than what we saw in 2019. Yeah, no, nah, I'm with you guys. Um, I'm still stuck on the part before the draft, like the free agency part of this. Like, there's some, <laughs> there's some people that can, there's a couple people in free agency that can alter the league should they move. Um, and you know, again, you mentioned Aaliyah Boston, Lord, if she ends up here, that's crazy. Um, you're giving that man exactly what. He doesn't need, um, but that's on y'all. He has the pick, you know. I'm just here, insert any popcorn meme you find on Twitter. That's me just waiting to see what he does. But uh, if you have players that don't play for him, talking about y'all done messed up, let that sink in. Like, people around the league know they done messed up. Like, come on, man. Around um, basketball, he's the, most, he, he's the most qualified basketball mind at Monumental under that umbrella, period. Yes, he is. All right, what we're going to do real quick is toss to a, a quick video about a big event coming up, Slam Dunk Hoopole East preview. Uh, then when we get back, Cardell's going to add uh, some more context to it. Welcome to the 2021 Slam Dunk to the Beach announcement special. The top high school hoops is back at the beach after a year off. Let's get right to meeting this year's teams that will be putting on a show in Lewis, December 27th through the 29th. Welcome back the Lions of Roselle Catholic, led by junior Simeon Wilcher and Akil Watson. Roselle is always a crowd favorite. Wilcher entertained 22 offers before the top 15 player in the country decided to head to North Carolina, while Watson is a power down low and has 14 offers himself. The Camden Panthers are at slam dunk for the first time and they'll bring the nation's top player in the junior class. That's Dewan Wagner Jr. Son of Memphis and NBA star Dewan Wagner, 
Jr. has strong interest from Kentucky and a bunch of other college basketball's blue bloods. Second-ranked junior center Aaron Bradshaw gives the Panthers a presence in the paint. PA's Archbishop Wood is back to slam dunk after going 19-1 and losing in the PIAA Class 6A championship game by a single point. Wood will look to reload after graduating a nine-player senior class that included 4,000-point scores and four Division I recruits. Junior Deshaun Harris-Smith and senior Michigan commit Doug McDaniel will lead Paul VI back to Lewis. Harris-Smith is getting interest from regional powers like Penn State, Maryland, Georgetown, and George Mason, as well as LSU. While four-star McDaniel will head to Ann Arbor after ranking as the 14th best point guard and 83rd overall prospect in the senior class. Blair Academy is participating in Slam Dunk for the first time. Senior shooting guard Otega Owe is heading to Oklahoma, while junior point guard Jaden Lamond is a top 40 player in the class, and he's weighing 16 offers. Our Savior Lutheran returns to Lewis. The Bronx Independent High School has brought some big-time players in previous years, including Posh Alexander, who's at St. John's, Pitts Maxim Madison, and Maximus Edwards, who starts at Kansas State this season. Current senior guard Jaquan Sanders will join Alexander at St. John's next season. Westtown has made a big name for themselves at Slam Dunk. NBA standouts like Mo Bamba and Cam Reddish have graced the Cape Henlopen and floor in years past, but this year it's Derek Lively's turn for a huge tournament. Lively recently committed to Duke to follow in Reddish's footsteps to Durham. The number two player in the senior class will be well worth the price of admission this year. The 16th best player in the junior class, Justin Edwards, and his Emotep Institute Panthers will head to slam dunk for the first time. Edwards has interest from colleges all over the country, including Ohio State, Kentucky, and Virginia. Six foot 11 inch favor I Ray from Bishop McNamara is bound to block a shot or five and will likely live up to the slam dunk to the beach name with some play above the rim. Gray Collegiate from West Columbia, South Carolina makes the return to Lewis. The War Eagles were part of one of the best games in slam dunk history when Jalik Felton took on Cam Reddish, Mo Bamba, and Westtown. Could the War Eagles rock the building again in 2021? Gil St. Bernard's has one of the deepest teams at Slam Dunk this year. McKenzie Mbako is the third best player in the junior class. He's headed to Duke. ESPN's top sophomore Nasir Cunningham and senior Denver England will power the Knights team that is probably one of the strongest to ever play at Slam Dunk to the Beach. The furthest trip to Lewis belongs to the Arizona Compass Prep Dragons. Senior Sadra K. Nganga is the senior class's sixth best power forward. Dylan Andrews is the seventh best point guard in the senior class. Mookie Cook is the 4th best junior, and Killen Boswell is the 11th best junior. Long story short, the Dragons will be fun to watch. Bergen Catholic's Crusaders are led by senior Will Richardson, who's headed to Fordham, and sophomore Elliot Cadeau. Rounding out the field are the Eagles of National Christian out of Fort Washington, Maryland, Delaware's Seaford, and Bishop Walsh from Maryland. Here's a look at the full schedule, all three days of basketball here at Cape Henlopen High School in Lewis, Delaware. Tickets will be available soon, so make sure you hop on, get your day passes or session passes at slamdunktothebeach.com. Excited to have you back at the beach December 27th, 28th, and 29th for Slam Dunk to the Beach 2021. All right, Cardell. Any, 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 uh, any more you wanted to add to this? Uh, I feel like the video did quite a bit, but the floor is yours. Uh, just to let people know, the event will take place next week, December 27th to the 29th, as you saw on the schedule. Uh, it's usually called Slam Dunk to the Beach. That takes place out in Delaware. But this year, Hoop Hall, which is the Naismith Hall of Fame, uh, they're starting four regional events, and they pretty much partner up with Slam Dunk since the event is already known and one of the best high school events you can go to. It has been pretty much since I've been in high school. Uh you know, they just partnered up with them, so um, to add their prestige to it. So uh, it's the first year they're doing it, and, um, you know, it, it should be even better than what it normally is, man. You know, it's one of my favorite showcases to go scout, you know, to go cover. And, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Y'all saw the, y'all see the talent on hand. It's just the next wave of the top college and uh, college stars and, you know, NBA picks, man. But, you know, just keeping it a buck. So uh, it's going to be fun. I'll be down there all three days next week. And, uh Best believe I'll have a lot uh, to come. You know, I'll probably try to do a live segment from there as well. We're doing next week's show. All right, folks, as always, want to thank you guys for uh, hanging with us this evening. Hope you all have a 
Happy holidays this weekend. And like Cardell said, be back next week with a whole lot to get through. As always, um, Wednesday mornings, Roku, 9 a.m. Fridays, 10 p.m. on DCTV. You guys have a great evening. And don't forget, get over to the focustv.com.